Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the EMEA Earnings Season webinar. My name is Remy Claire, and I will be your host and your moderator today. I am the Global Sales Readiness Director for our research and portfolio manage management business here at Refindiv, um, and that really means that I look after global business development for this segment of our brand. These are exciting times as we are entering our third month as one company under the London Stock Exchange Group. This is quite the milestone for LSEG and Refindiv brands. As a combined organization, we'll continue to support our clients and across the markets and the communities that we already serve. Um, but we'll also look to continue innovating and delivering value as a combined global leader in data and analytics. There is plenty of work underway to make sure we are uh, producing next generation solutions for our clients, and I'm really happy to be a part of that effort. If you have any questions or want to have a broader discussion, please reach out to your account manager, um, or you'll also find a survey widget at the bottom of your screen, and the team will reach out to you accordingly. But today we're coming together to hear from Tim Gammer, our Global Director of Innovation and Fundamental Research here at Refindiv. Using the Star Mind Smart Estimate and Predicted Surprise data, Tim will showcase the 10 European companies the team has forecasted to both beat and miss 2020 fiscal year earnings, as well as show you how to build out your own forecast um, using star mine data and icon. This is a particularly remarkable time for two reasons. One, this marks the 20th anniversary of the star mine smart estimate. And two, the team's European selections for the fiscal year 2019 were 100% accurate, which is very, very cool. Before I pass the baton on to Tim, let's quickly cover a few housekeeping items. So first, at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget at the bottom or alternatively on the left side of your screen and submit your question. We'd like to encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar and we'll try to get to as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end. Uh, secondly, you're also able to access various resources, including earnings predictions for other regions, uh, as well as today's slide deck in the resources section on the right-hand side of your console. And lastly, we will be sending you the recording of the webcast, as well as a copy of today's slide deck following the presentation. So right before we get over to Tim, what I'd, we'd like to do is get a sense of right now who is in our audience. So if you could please just record what type of company you work for, we'll give you a few moments to do that. And then we'll move on. Okay, it seems that we might be having an issue with our pop-up. So if you haven't yet, you can click directly on the screen um, to record your answer, and we'll just give a few more moments to do that. I do see people submitting now. All right, fantastic. Okay, um, we do see a collection across the board. Fantastic. So we do have some variety in our audience. Um, and then our second question before we get to the presentation is, are you currently incorporating quantitative tools as part of your investment decision-making process or workflow? And please just use the same process, click right on the screen, um, and then we will take a look at the results. I see a few rolling in. We'll give you a few more moments. Okay, interesting. We also have a mix across the board. So in terms of on a consistent basis, we have some veterans, um, and not at the moment. Hopefully we can educate you a bit more today. Uh, so without further ado, I will pass it over to Tim. Thank you, Remy, and uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of those who have attended today. Um, so uh, Starmine is now a brand, but uh, back in uh, you know the late 90s and early 2000s, we were one of the original fintechs uh, before the term was even coined. Um, so we were building predictive analytics and stock ranking quantitative models, um, you know, way back uh, when that was uh, sort of a pioneering effort. Uh, we became part of Reuters in early 2008, uh, then uh, shortly at, thereafter, part of Thomson Reuters, uh, which is uh, the financial and risk business of which is now Refinitiv, 
uh, which is part of the London Stock Exchange Group, which Remy mentioned. So an exciting development here. So a lot of transitions. What it's done for us is given our quant research team access to a wide variety of different content sets and a vast array of data. So uh, they, they have a lot of things to play around with. Uh, we continue to build out our suite of predictive models uh, and we try to do so in a very transparent, uh, clear box method. Uh, we don't build black boxes, that doesn't do anyone much good. So you can drill into each of our models, uh, figure out what's driving the score high or low, uh, why quantitatively in a very objective way uh, it likes it or doesn't think it's uh, a, a great investment opportunity. Uh, so think of it as an unbiased, you know, second opinion. So we've been building predictive analytics for a long time now. As Remy said, we're excited to be celebrating the 20th anniversary of the StarMind Smart Estimate, our first commercially available analytic. Uh, it forms the basis for our earnings surprise forecast, which I'll be sharing momentarily. Uh, so it's uh, interesting that it's just as predictive today as it was 20 years ago, uh, because it's based on behavioral factors and human behavior, as we've all observed, is slow to change. Uh, it was probably even more predictive in the last year uh, than it has over its long history. Uh, like, like Remy said, we got a 10 for 10, 100% accurate in Europe. Uh, we're not going to beat that. 90% uh, accurate in Japan, 80% accurate in Asia PAC, and our last uh, forecast for North America got nine out of 10 directionally correct. So pretty remarkable results uh, in a time of great uncertainty. So I won't keep you in suspense. I'll show you our current uh, predictions of companies we expect to beat or miss across the MIA. Uh, and then I'll come back at the end and show you how we're doing so far. Some of these companies have already reported so companies we expect to beat, uh, Airbus, Covestro, Dialog Semiconductor, and Tain, and HelloFresh. A uh, couple there shouldn't be too surprising. You know, HelloFresh is delivering food to all of us who don't want to go to the supermarket. Uh, casinos and gaming, maybe a little more unusual. Those that we expect to miss, looking at the smart estimate and the predicted surprise. Uh, Hugo Boss, yeah, I haven't bought a suit in a while. Um, Ferrovial, any of uh, the parent company of British Air, not a huge surprise there, and ISS. So I'll show you how we constructed this, and I'll show you how you can build your own forecast. You know, you can beat us to the punch or anticipate what's going to pop up next. Uh, use it for new idea generation. Uh, so it's all based on the StarMind Smart Estimate, now 20 years old, and the predicted surprise percent. Uh, this is how we construct our earnings season forecast. We've been doing it for many years with a great track record. Uh, we'll show you how to build your own and other places you can find ours. We do this for regions other than just Europe. So it's based on our foundations, which is the ability to rate and rank every sell side analyst. The smart estimate places more weight on the more accurate analysts and the more recent forecasts. How do we know an analyst is going to be more accurate? Well, it turns out it's a predictive skill uh, and it persists. Those who are more likely to be accurate in the future are those same analysts who have been more accurate historically. Uh, but we don't just look at one period, you know, anybody can get lucky. Uh, we look at their forecasts for companies that report quarterly over the last four quarters and the last two fiscal years. Uh, to get a five-star rating, the most accurate, an analyst has to do three things well. They have to be different than consensus no extra credit for just following the herd. Uh, they have to move early in the period, giving investors an opportunity to react to their forecast. And they ultimately have to have more accuracy than the consensus, closer to the actual results shown here in black. 
This is how we display it in uh, ICON. So this would be the details estimates view for those of you who have looked at ICON. Um, and I just blurred out the name of the actual analyst name and the brokerage firm to which that person is affiliated. You know, it's their intellectual property here. You can see the star ratings, one to five. Five is the most accurate, one is the least accurate. Um, <clears throat> you'll see one estimate here that's highlighted in green. Uh, we call that a bold estimate. Uh, this analyst is exhibiting unusual behavior really sticking his or her neck out with an estimate that deviates significantly from consensus and from a five-star most accurate analyst. You know, maybe pays to pay attention to this analyst. The smart estimate is shown on the right with the gold bars highlighting those analysts who are a part of the smart estimate. So we use a revision cluster algorithm saying, well, this collection of five analysts moved away from consensus, revised in the same direction within a few days of each other, obviously reacting to some new information that's entered the market. They're company experts. They found it compelling to publish new estimates based on that information. The analysts are sort of lagging behind. We show X cluster, not, they're not part of the earnings cluster. Uh, when they catch up, they'll enter the, the smart estimate as well. And then any estimate older than 120 days is shown at the bottom here as X age. Um, so really outdated. I guess that's why this analyst gets only one star. Uh, so as those anal analysts who are not part of the smart estimate right now enter it by publishing new estimates themselves, um, it moves the consensus in the direction of this smart estimate. So the smart estimate is not only predictive of future earnings surprises, but also the direction of uh, consensus change. Uh, you can see that illustrated here. The smart estimate shown in uh, or orange or gold. Consensus is shown in blue. You can see the consensus is trying to catch up, but hasn't gotten there yet. Um, the smart estimate, of course, is especially interesting when it's significantly different than consensus. Uh, you can see that uh, shown in the panel below. The smart estimate is 3.6% higher than consensus. Uh, we call that percentage difference the predicted surprise percent. And when it's plus or minus 2% different than consensus, it gets the direction of subsequent earning surprises correct 70% of the time. So that's what we build this forecast on. And it also feeds into a number of our other quantitative models wherever you need a more accurate version of consensus, which is a lot of places. We have an analyst revisions model. Uh, it feeds into relative valuation, which is a measure of six different forward and backward looking ratios. So we use this for the forward looking ratios. Also intrinsic valuation, this is a dividend discount model we start with our more accurate smart estimate, and then we also adjust for the bias that we find in analyst estimates, especially for fast growing companies and estimates that are farther into the future, there tends to be an optimism bias. Very predictable, it's a behavioral thing. Uh, because it's predictable, we can back it out. Uh, and then that goes into some of our combination models like valuation momentum, or a combined alpha model, which combines all of our alpha models into a single optimized combination, and we optimize that by region. <clears throat> it also feeds into our smart ratios credit risk model, also looking at a combination of forward and backward looking ratios to predict the likelihood of a company's default or bankruptcy risk. So I'll tell you a little about the analyst revisions model. It's also very predictive of the direction of future revisions, which is correlated with price change. It's been one of our most predictive and most popular models. It would be really hard to build uh, because first of all, you have to do what we do, rate and rank every sell side analyst who submits an estimate to IBIS. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a deal killer right there. Um, 
it differs from sort of the academic or classical treatment of revisions. Uh, it doesn't just look at EPS change over the most current period, but it looks across the income statement, uh, not just at earnings per share, but also secondary earnings like EBITDA and revenue revisions, and multiple um, forward-looking estimate periods. This is a company that only reports annually. If it reported quarterly, we'd also show that. But you can see here changes in EPS, so positive revisions shown in green. If there were negative revisions, we'd show that in red. Uh, we also show EBITDA changes and revenue changes. We look at a blended period, so a number of different look back periods, 7, 14, 30, 60, 90 days. And here's where the smart estimate comes into play, looking at the predicted surprise. Where there's a predicted surprise combined with changes in consensus in the same direction, as you see for the current year and for next year for EPS, it's a corroborating method. It, it gives us more confidence that this company will see future positive earnings revisions or earnings surprises. We also take into consideration changes in recommendations, so buy, sell, hold ratings. Also a reinforcing signal. Here's a great positive example right now, CNH Industrial NV. Uh, you can see here it also gets a combined alpha model rating of 89 out of 100. All of these scores are one to 100 percentile ranks where 100 is the best, one is the worst. So bullish signals are shown in green you see it all across the board here. So you see positive revisions, large ones, for this quarter in EPS, EBITDA, and revenue. See it for the full year results and for next year, also accompanied by nice positive predicted surprise percents. Uh, we also see positive changes in recommendations. These analysts are really becoming more constructive on this company All of our models have broad global coverage, with the exception of two that are US only, short interest and in insider filings. Uh, but we score up to 42,000 companies globally. Uh, you'll not only find the smart estimate and predicted surprise in our quant models, but you can also find it in a bunch of workflow apps within ICON. So even if you're a traditional fundamental asset manager and you don't use quantitative multi-factor models as part of your stock selection process, you'll find some interesting information with an icon that can really be an efficiency uh, addition to your traditional research workflow. Um, not only is the predicted surprise and the smart estimate interesting on a per company basis, or in some of our quantitative models, it's also informative when aggregated. So we have an ICON aggregate app, AGGR is the, the short code. And so here I'm showing some of the most positive and the most negative. So these are companies where leading analysts have jumped out ahead of consensus and they represent the more recent estimates. So on the left panel, you see those that have the highest positive predicted surprise. Again, bullish signals shown in green. So you see a lot of economically sensitive companies popping up here. Um, on the right-hand side, you see those that have had, you know, consent, uh, leading analysts move way below consensus. So these are more bearish signals, companies that are likely to miss in these industries or see further downward revisions in the consensus numbers. <clears throat> uh, you can aggregate a, a number of our models. Uh, ARM, the analyst revisions model, is also informative in aggregate. Uh, so here you can see these are not just companies that would have positive and negative predicted surprise numbers, uh, but these are the ones where we've seen downward revisions across multiple time periods and across the income statement. 
So the positive ones are a lot of base metals, things like iron and steel, oil and gas, as prices have firmed up, aluminum, you know, a bit of shortages here. Coal might be a little surprising, but I think this is probably tied to number one, iron and steel rather than thermal coal. You can click on any of these in ICON and drill down into the individual companies and actually pull up some research and see, you know, what's going on here. Um, on the right, not too many surprises. Uh, airport operators, uh, yeah, <laughs> not so good. Airlines themselves. Um, more surprising is renewable fuels, at least to me. I'm not sure what's going on there. And discount stores. You'd think people would be shopping for bargains right now. You can track the earnings season for yourself as it unfolds. Uh, we'll help you do that. Uh, we publish a couple of reports. Um, one is called This Week in Earnings. Uh, we tell what's going on with companies that are beating, missing, but we follow the S&P 500. Uh, sometimes we'll put this out for the 400 and the 600 mid cap and small cap um, indices. But here you can follow your own on your own investable universe. You can put in a list or you can follow an index like I have here looking at the stock 600. So uh, more than half of companies have now reported uh, more are beating than missing. And then I rank these by GIC sectors. You can also use Thomson Reuters business classifications. Um, and you can see that financials are doing the best here in terms of the beat miss ratio. Uh, utilities for some reason are mostly coming up short. Uh, we show a number of other things. So not only companies that have beat or missed expectations uh, reflected by the consensus estimate or the IBIS mean. Uh, we show the reported actual surprise percent of those that have actually reported. We use the predicted surprise, here it shows up again, for companies who have yet to report. Um, year over year growth for companies who haven't yet reported. We turn to the smart estimate to see which direction they're likely to go. So kind of a mixed bag here. Uh, for next year, uh, we show changes in consensus of those who've reported or yet to report. Think of maybe this as an indicator of guidance. How have analysts responded once the company's actually reported? So for things like financials, uh, not only have a bunch of those companies in that sector reported positive surprises, but analysts have moved their estimates significantly higher afterward. Must be getting some good news out of those earnings calls. And then we show how has the market responded to that? So price changes within two days of a company's reporting. So not terribly surprising. Those that have been that beat have been rewarded by the market. Uh, those that have middling results uh, have uh, kind of a combination of, you know, purchases and sell-offs. You can customize your earnings season application actually by incorporating more aggregates data. So. The, like I said, the analyst revisions model is one of our most predictive. It performs well across regions. Uh, it's our best seller, actually, as a quant feed. And you can see here, you know, I can type in analyst revisions model or it's shortcut arm. Select this. You can get it on a regional basis or a country or a sector or a global rank. Let's add that to the mix. Here, I can add it as a column over on the right-hand side. So adding to the collection of analytics that we can use to track earnings season. Um, you can sort that among a number of different ways, You're not limited just business classification sectors or industries. You can also look at different indices. You know, 
how are indices across Europe or EMEA doing? So you see the most positive number of companies beating uh, in the DAX, uh, followed by, you know, FTSE 100 is doing pretty well here in third place. Uh, the Swiss market is at the bottom, but be aware that that's a pretty limited number of, say, 30, 40 companies among some of these like Stockholm and Swiss market indices, kind of a small sample size. Now I'll show you how you can build your own forecast. The same method that we do, you know, beat us to the punch, apply it to areas where we don't uh, publish forecasts, use it to help in your own stock selection process, or to help you time entry and exit points when uh, considering what to do with companies either in your portfolio or on your watch list. So this is how we screen for companies with a uh, European positive surprise. So first of all, we select the region. So any companies that trade on a European exchange. Uh, for our forecast, we want companies that you may recognize the name of. So we're looking at those with a $5 billion market cap or larger. Uh, we want five or more analysts, so we're not placing too much confidence. I'm just a couple. Uh, we're looking for a predicted surprise, of course. Here's the statistically significant threshold of 2% or more. So this is for positive surprises. We want this to be a positive 2%. Uh, for our negative forecast, we make it uh, minus 2%. Uh, we want companies that are going to report fairly soon, but not so soon that they report before we get our forecast published. Uh, and we'd like to see uh, an analyst revisions model in the same direction as our positive predicted surprise number. Uh, then we apply a, a light human overlay, which even improves the 70% accuracy that we would get just right out of the box on a quantitative only method. Um, you know, are there a large enough number of analyst estimates? Uh, recent analyst revisions, or is these sort of stale data? Um, are analysts revising in the same direction, or is there broad disagreement among analysts? Are they all over the place? They're not so confident in those cases. And are those any of those bold estimates? Uh, we create these forecasts not just for Europe, but also for North America. We do that quarterly. Uh, Asia Pacific, uh, we've created our first one this year for Latin America. Uh, we did one last year for Japan, uh, for the ASEAN area, and Australia. So what do we do with our light human overlay? What increases or decreases our confidence and our accuracy of predictions. Um, here you can see broad disagreement among analysts and recent estimates are all over the place. So this decreases our confidence in the predicted surprise percent. You can see here there are two five-star analysts, both with recent estimates, one at 0.51 euro, one at 0.95 euro. So we have a bold estimate in the positive direction, but an equally accurate analyst that are like almost half that level. You can see throughout all these estimates, they're all over the place. Here's another five-star analyst at 0.49 and one at 0.83. I don't know who to believe here. We can move on to another example. <laughs> um, betting it all on a single analyst seems pretty risky. You know. Here the smart estimate is driven by an analyst um, with four stars at 1.14. Um, but a lot of these other ones are all X age. So they're older than 120 days old. And I'm not gonna bet it all just on this one analyst. Um, here are two few analysts are on the same basis. So in IBIS for the consensus or the IBIS mean, um, we use majority rules. Um, so analysts who are on the same accounting basis 
uh, the majority of those get added into the IBIS mean. The other ones we display, but we exclude from the mean because they're on some different basis. Like some are on IFRS, others aren't. Uh, some are using, you know, in the U.S., non-GAAP earnings, uh, excluding things like stock options. Um, so we, we use majority rules. Here there are too few actually in the, um, the same basis. Uh, we also rule out those where there's a significant positive predicted surprise amount, like 2.19%, that's within our threshold. But when we look at the, cur the currency difference, um, there's not enough difference to give us conviction. Here you see in Hong Kong dollars, the consensus is 0.111. The smart estimate is 0 0.114. So I started off by showing our, our forecast. See, how are we doing so far? Well, a lot of these companies are quick to report. So for our positive surprises, you can see we've got four out of five directionally correct. So Airbus beat, Covestro beat, Dialog Semiconductor, it beat, uh, and Tane let us down. And Hello Fresh had a nice positive surprise. The negative ones, we're still waiting on Hugo Boss. We got the next three correct, but with ISS, uh, we missed by a little bit. So 78% accurate, see? So seven out of nine, we have a chance to hit 80% here. Be pretty respectable. As I said, we set an impossible benchmark for ourselves last year by getting 10 for 10. With that, we're happy to entertain questions. You can type those into your chat box. Um, here's where you can find our other earnings season forecasts. So we publish it to our research blog called Lipper Alpha Insight, where we combined our analysis with those from our Lipper research team. You can also find it, as I've shown you screenshots of, within the Icon desktop or workspace. Um, so type lipperalpha.refinitiv.com to go to our website. It's of course free, you don't even have to register. Um, you can type alpha in icon. Uh, in those places, you can also find our predictions for North America, for Asia Pacific, where I don't think we've had any companies report yet, and for Latin America. Of course, the recording and slides will be shared around after the webinar. Please follow up if you have any other questions as you go back and look through the slides. Um, if you'd like to hear more about the star mine models, predicted surprise, how to access smart estimates, uh, or ICON, you know, just uh, respond in our survey here. Well, great. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Remy, I'll kick it over to you for some Q&A. Great. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, okay. Well, if you could please also make sure you're submitting your Q&A through the chat, but I see a couple of things coming in, so we'll get started on that. Um, so, Tim, in terms of pent-up consumer demand from 2020 due to COVID, where do you see this flowing in 2021? And do we expect any surprises on industries that may benefit more or less? Uh, yes, I, I think so. Let's, let's let the data try to answer that question for us. Um, get back to my slide that shows that. takes a little bit to navigate here. Hmm. Sorry, I'm gonna have to click back through them this way, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, so in, in terms of what's happening with, with COVID and with um, you know the, the economy right now opening back up, um, there's actually a lot of disruptions in supply chains, of course. Um, you've probably heard about semiconductor shortages uh, showing up here in like computer hardware. Uh, they've got a lot of pricing power right now. Uh, normally when demand is high, uh, there's too much supply that comes in, making uh, you know computers, semiconductors, and semiconductor capital equipment highly cyclical. Uh, we're seeing that uh, extend the cycle this year um, with full, you know, China is actually enacting an, a number of clean air regulations. That means some of the dirtiest coal is going unused. Uh, so the cleaner coal comes at a higher price. You know, perhaps that's what's improving analysts' outlook for earnings and revenue. Uh, iron and steel is seeing benefits from higher prices, and so has oil and gas. You know, as, as a lot of capacity went offline and has yet to come back and, you know, fairly well contained pricing behavior. Uh, as I look over here where the analysts have become the most negative, um, you know, some of them aren't surprising, you know, like with motels and cruise lines. Although we've seen a reopening trade where even though some of these companies have had negative earning surprises and down re revisions, people are speculating about the day when vaccines kick in and improve the outlook. So actually in terms of price changes, a, a number of airlines and um, hospitality industries have seen you know, um, big price jumps. But you know, in terms of fundamentals, it still looks a little premature. Oh, fair enough. Um, I think the next one, actually, you're very conveniently on uh, the slide we need to be on. Um, and sort of coming back towards fossil fuels, I mean, as global demand increases as we come out of, uh, you know, stagnation here, where do we sort of see fossil fuels going versus renewable energy? Um, and then also, I guess, part of the second part of this question is, can you speculate on the size impact the Texas deep freeze has had on this space? Ooh. Well, I don't think we've seen a lot of results from the Texas deep freeze flow through the earnings yet. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, the analysts who get a quick jump on things. Um, I think for one thing, you know, it may say we need to consider our infrastructure. Um, perhaps that we're seeing here in independent power producers. Um, Oil and gas, refining, marketing, as those come back online. Um, but yeah, I'm interested here in these independent power producers. Um, let's see, on the negative, well, exploration and production, you know, a lot of that went offline because of low, you know, energy prices. The, the frackers, you know, took a lot of wells out of service. Um, you know, I think that's probably where we're seeing it. But now with oil prices at, back up at about $70 a barrel, uh, well off its lows, I think that's what we're seeing here in a lot of these uh, oil-related services and equipment as activity resumes and oil and gas drilling. Uh, oh, we'll have another one popping in. Okay. How do you see the expectation of inflationary pressures this year and next year? Um, and I guess, how do you see that expectation flowing to analyst forecasts? Uh, and then also, sorry, as a tertiary part of that, I suppose, is, are we seeing that pronounced in any particular region? Um, yeah, I, I think we are seeing some signs of that. Um, so you can see here in like investment banking and brokerage services, that's a combination of, I think, higher M&A activity, more trading, uh, IPO issuances um, and secondary offerings. You know, there was a dash for cash, um, you know, earlier in last year 
as uh, you know, it looked like um, you know a lot of companies were going to go through a earnings drought. Um, I think you see some of that here with the financial sector doing really well. And actually you can see we've had a lot of positive price reactions. Uh, I think the inflationary pressures you're seeing uh, is doing things like steepening the yield curve. So, you know, now it's not just the investment banks who are benefiting from more deals, more M&A, uh, more stock issuances, but it's now the, the smaller regional and retail focused banks who are still able to collect deposits and pay essentially nothing to their depositors while lending out longer term at, at higher rates than they've been able to do for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Very, very interesting. Thank you for the commentary on that one. Um, and we have one more question in. So if anyone has anything else, um, please feel free to put that in the chat. But another sort of COVID-based question, as that is obviously a very popular subject. Um, if we're looking uh -oh. over the of the past year, how did you see the uncertainty of the crisis as it unfolded? Um, and I guess the associated volatility translate into analyst behavior throughout the year. And I guess, and how did you see that flow into predicted surprise, more predictive or less predictive than usual? Yeah, I thought it was really interesting what we discovered. I would have thought that there was so much uncertainty about, you know, the economy, about individual companies. Uh, analysts were probably slow to respond. I would think there would be massive disagreement among analysts and strategists about the direction of companies' earnings and profitability levels and the economy itself. Um, I would have thought it'd be harder to make things like a predicted surprise work. It actually worked better than ever. Now, I say we got 100% directionally correct in EMEA. Uh, it was highly predictive in North America, in Asia PAC, in Japan, everywhere we've created a forecast. The smart estimate predicted surprise was much more accurate than just the average of a uh, collection of analyst estimates. In fact, <clears throat> um, because our last forecast for EMEA, you know, came in, you know, about this time last year before the full effects of COVID kicked in, uh, I think the best test of how did it do would be looking at our North America results because there are a lot of companies report quarterly. We have a rich collection of quarterly estimates. And so we publish four earning season forecasts a year for North America. And um, so I, I looked back and see how did we do throughout all of last year, taking into consideration the effects of COVID. So for our fourth quarter, um, 2019 results, uh, we were 80% directionally correct. You know, about as good as we normally do. Uh, but then as the effect of COVID came into play, influencing our forecast for Q1 results, we got nine for 10. So it was 90% correct. Uh, in the summer where the full effect of COVID was affecting earnings surprises and company results and profitabilities. We got 10 for 10. The smart estimate was 100% directionally correct as measured by the predicted surprise. And our forecast for Q3 came in at 90%. So those are well above our long run averages. And so I'd say that that's a good measure of the fact that, you know, during times of uncertainty, you know, this adds more value than even during regular times where it's, you know, roughly 80% directionally correct, which is pretty impressive on its own. And are, so I'm guessing, I mean, because super, super interesting, have, and I'm thinking in your time and role, have you seen sort of kind of a similar outcome in other market anomalies, I guess just more generally, or is because COVID is kind of more of an elongated sort of a market anomaly in and of itself, or is this kind of more of a... a you know, kind of isolated event in terms of the increased um, sort of reliability on the predicted surprise on that one? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's an isolated event. Uh, it's, it's effective during uh, any time of uh, market dislocations where there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, we saw it sort of in 2007, 2008, as we went into the financial crisis. Um, the majority of analysts 
were uh, too hesitant to aggressively revise down earnings forecasts. But our most accurate analyst in the more recent estimate, you know, emphasized in the smart estimate, uh, it was ahead of the crowd. Uh, we saw the same thing in 2009 as we sort of March of 2009, we came out of that deep bear market. Um, and again, it was those leading analysts uh, who led the pack. So it's, it's especially predictive and useful during any sort of periods of market or economic disruptions or regime changes. We're seeing actually a couple of questions flowing off the back of that. Um, what, what was the long run average of predictability? Oh, so the long run average, uh, just like taking the analytic or the metric right out of the box and not doing our light human overlay in our newsletters, that long run average uh, is about 70% for earnings surprise forecasts. Um, we create smart estimates, not just on EPS, but on all kinds of things that analysts publish forecasts on, things like um, you know EBITDA and revenue and even things like net debt. Um, so if they publish forecasts on it, and we have a significant number of them, we create the smart estimate and predicted surprise for that. It's even more accurate for revenue predicted surprises. Uh, there it gets uh, surprises directionally correct about 78% of the time on the long run average. And uh, our published forecasts run slightly ahead of the, the averages. And then also off the back of that, more of a model specific question. Um, do StarMind's quant models show the value factors are starting to work again? Oh, yeah, you see we look at valuation in a, a couple of different ways. Um, both relative valuation and intrinsic valuation. You know, it's been flip-flopping. We look at this every month and say, how is all of our models actually performed in real life in various markets? Uh, we look at a, a bunch of different regions and countries around the world. Um, in some places, like Asia, um, momentum still dominates. Uh, other places we're seeing valuation work really well in one month and then not well at all in a different month. Um, in general, I think we've seen some rotation to value here uh, and away from simply growth and momentum. But there's also some sector biases if you're just looking at the underlying index. You know, if you're looking at like the Russell 1000 growth versus Russell 1000 value, yeah, you'll see the value index working a bit better right now as well as smaller cap stocks. But I think part of that is what are the constituents within, say, the valuation index? Um, has a lot of financial sector companies in there. Right? So those have been deeply out of favor over the last year or two. Uh, so they're overrepresented in the value index. You won't see much tech in the value index. Uh, well, tech's been selling off recently. So I think part of it is you know, a rotation to value, but I think part of it is a rotation to things like banks and other financial sector companies and things that just have a much larger weight within the value index. A lot of the economically sensitive companies like industrials, uh, as people bet that we're gonna reopen the economy uh, and that there might be some inflation, See, so you're, you're seeing people take more interest in some of these deeply economically sensitive and cyclical companies. And can you comment why APAC has been largely more momentum driven? It traditionally has been. Um, it's hard to explain why. Um, but in some places, it's just value is rewarded more. <laughs> Japan is the exception to Asia, actually. Uh, Japan seems to reward value models more than, say, momentum or earnings quality or analyst revisions. Uh, actually, we reflect that in our combined alpha model. So for places like Asia PAC or even Europe, where it's more momentum driven, uh, people you know, seem to follow a trend following kind of um, investment strategy. Um, <clears throat> we place more weight on like the momentum and analyst revisions model and less on valuation. Uh, Japan is 
kind of the opposite. It always trades differently than any other Asian market. Uh, there we place 50% of the weight in our combined alpha model on our valuation factors and reduce the weight on the more momentum correlated factors. Uh, the U.S. is somewhere in between. Sorry, I was actually just writing that down for myself. Um, no, that's mm -hmm. excellent. Thank you so much, Tim. I think we have gotten to the end of our question. So if anyone has anything sort of more last minute, please feel free to put it in the chat. Be sure, um, or if you have any questions after, please let us know. I am going to, apologies for the switch in slides, but just to get to the end of our thank you slide. Oh, one more, okay, great. Um, so thank you to everyone for dialing in and thank you very much for the presentation, Tim, found that incredibly interesting. Um, and thanks guys for your engagement during the webinar. We'll be reaching out to everyone following the session with the slides and the recording, and we will get back to any questions that, uh, you know, didn't get around to ask. So please feel free to reach out and we hopefully will see you all on another webinar soon. Hope everyone is staying well and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.